welcome to Inside Edition to discuss national, uh, regional and international issues in depth. Today we are going to speak about the visit of a leading religious freedom advocate to the Kingdom of Bahrain. He is an author and uh, the founder and CEO of the Kairos Company, a public relations and communications consulting firm. He has served as an advisor to multiple presidential candidates and he was previously Chief of Staff and Vice President of uh, Faith Content for Mark uh, Burnett's uh, United Artists Media Group. We are joined today by Reverend Johnny Moore, the founder of the Interdenominational Congress of Christian Leaders. We will be discussing with him the large strides the Kingdom of Bahrain has taken throughout its history as well as his efforts to promote peace and tolerance. This is after a short break. Welcome back. Joining us in the studio is Reverend Johnny Moore. Thank you very much for joining us today. We know you have a very tight schedule, and uh, thanks a lot for making it to us. No, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. All right, great. Your visit to Bahrain here is the second one, actually, and um, you come at a time where there's a lot of initiation when it comes to um, promoting tolerance and coexistence. Bahrain um, has officially launched the King Hamad uh, Global Center for Peaceful Coexistence. What can you tell us about your visit? Well, first of all, it's, it's a privilege to be back in beautiful Bahrain. I mean, it, it's a, a, an island country that when I step off the airplane, I feel something different here. And I, I think it's most um, encapsulated in the message of the King Hamad Center. But what strikes me the most is, you know, we were just talking about this a little while ago. I mean, it, you know, His Majesty the King and the leaders here in this, in this kingdom, I mean, they have acted when other people have talked. Yes. And it was an unbelievable privilege to spend some time at the center with the leadership of the center. But they welcomed me as, as a guest, but you know, I, I felt like less of a guest and more a family because now, not in, just in this country, but around this entire region, around the world, you know, we've been meeting together, working on promoting peaceful coexistence. And Bahrain, like normal, is ahead of the pack. Yes. And uh, I've, I've listened to a couple of interviews you've done before and even some speeches that you've uh, given in front of audiences. And you really have that special uh, relationship uh, with Bahrain. I remember in one of your speeches you even said that it really does feel like home to you when, when, when you are here. Um, how, how do you see the, um, the interconnection between the society of Bahrain? How does it promote that feel? Well, in, in order to understand it, I, I think you have to go back to um, a few years ago, mm -hmm. which was uh, in 2014, 2015, you know, when ISIS was moving across northern Iraq and Syria. Uh, as, a, as a Christian, I was deeply, deeply concerned yeah. about what was happening to the historic Christian communities in northern Iraq. And so I went there. I got on an airplane. I traveled to uh, northern Iraq a month after Mosul fell. Yeah. And I, I interviewed the people that were, that were struggling. Uh, I, I got their experiences. I was, I was deeply, deeply impacted. I did everything I could to help everyone as uh, I could as quickly as I could. Yes. But when the situation calmed down, I was talking to a, a few uh, good friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I, I want to work on not reacting to a crisis. Like, I want to work on being proactive. Like, you know, how can we promote peaceful coexistence? Where, where are the models that are working? Like, where are people getting along? And, they, yes. and you know, several people told me, but in particular one friend. And he said, you have to go to Bahrain. You right. just have to go to Bahrain. It is different. I said, okay, you know, everybody tells me the things that are different. And, and then he said, oh, but in Bahrain, you know, there's a Hindu temple. I said, like, okay, you know, how old is it? 200 years old. Yeah. You know, and, and they're, 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 they're Christian churches, evangelical and Catholic and, and, and Coptic Orthodox that, and Anglican, and, and they, they've existed for forever. I mean, there's something unique about Bahrain. And I, I literally got on an airplane, and I was here uh, within weeks. It might have been days. And sure enough, uh, I saw with my own eyes what I had, what I had heard about. And I, I arrived on purpose on a Friday okay. because I wanted to see... Uh, on that day and throughout the weekend, the worshiping uh, communities. And yes. I, I believe then, as I believe now, that uh, coexistence is in the DNA of this country. Yes. And it has become my mission to promote it uh, all, all around the world, beginning in the Middle East and spreading from there. And now many, many people are believing it's possible because of the example of this country. Yes. Um, well, uh, Reverend, one of the, the things uh, that you have uh, worked on tirelessly um, is promoting peaceful coexistence and uh, tolerance among different religions. And, and you just mentioned it. Um, it was basically an advocacy that has uh, just spread into um, uh, to all countries. Tell us a little bit more about your work when it comes to promoting this coexistence. Well, you know, in this, in this kingdom, I mean, what, what's unique about here is 
sometimes it's difficult to get the Abrahamic religions together mm -hmm. to have a discussion. You know, to get the, you know, the the imams and the pastors and priests and the rabbis. Yes. You know, and, and we share mm -hmm. texts and history and things exactly. in common and geographic, uh, you know, centralized. We're all. You know, I know Christians in America think it's an American religion, but it's actually a Middle Eastern religion. Yes. You know, it yes, wasn't it founded in Arkansas. <laughs> you know, it was, it was founded in the, in this part of the world. Yes. But what I appreciate about about Bahrain is that the the tolerance and the religious freedom extends beyond the Abrahamic religions, yes. beyond uh, the historic religions here. You know, when I sit down and I, I talk to the Hindu community, for instance, um, you know, it's not, it's not just that they can worship freely in their temple. It's that, you know, out, outside of their temple, you can, you can, if you're a Hindu, you just, you'll see the Hindu gods, you can purchase them, you know, yes. and, and, you know, when, when it was the Hindu New Year, you know, the, the priest, uh, one of the priests here, I, I've gotten to know a bit, you know, he was telling me they had 10,000 people, thousands of people yeah. or something in their various festivities. And they're, you know, they, and these are not just Hindus. You know, mm -hmm. these are regular Bahrainis that are joining in the celebration. Correct. And so, you know, I, I've been looking for examples around the world um, that are running against the tide. Because the fact is that uh, people have used religion as a tool for conflict and sectarian strife and all of these things. Mm -hmm. But religion is meant to be a blessing to the world. Yes. Uh, and, and here, it shows that not only is it possible, but it's good for uh, a society. And and I, I am uh, uh, more hopeful every time I'm here, and uh, and and especially in seeing the work of Bahrain to promote uh, what what I what I you know have politely said was a was a secret, you know, yes. because there's there's a certain modesty in the kingdom here where yes. you know it, uh, okay this is this is unique here, but you know it's you know we don't want to talk about it too much because you know it's. You know, it's whatever. the work of the day. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's normal. Yeah. Yeah. But in this world we're living in, we need to demonstrate um, that, that this is possible. And now, you know, this entire region, you know, is moving in that direction. You know, the peer pressure is in, is in, 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 the, right, uh, in, in the right direction. And uh, Bahrain is, is leading the way. Yes. Well, um, before we move to uh, your personal um, uh, additions uh, to uh, the fight against extremism ideologies, um, if you were asked to pinpoint one certain trait where um, peaceful religions actually um, meet together, I mean, we're talking about the Abrahamic uh, religions as well as other religions. Yeah. Is there something that you see as this is the common factor? If everybody has this, that means they have a religion. Well, you know, I think some people think that in order to coexist, you have to be less religious, mm -hmm. right? So you have to sort of forsake your yeah. Christianity or your Islam or your whatever. And what I actually believe is that you can be entirely devout to your own faith and yet yeah. you can coexist you know, with others. And that, that's what, I, again, that's what I appreciate about being here. I don't feel like I have to be less of a Christian yeah. you know, to be here. You know, I'm, I'm an evangelical Christian. This is what I believe. And I, I think that's where religious freedom needs to go, right? Because if we just, if we just expect everyone to lay down their beliefs, yeah. You know, then, then we don't have we don't have freedom of religion. You know, we have uh, you know we have some kind of syncretism. You know, yeah. it's a, in, in, you know I'm not asking anybody to be less of a Christian to uh, see their neighbor who's a Muslim as an actual neighbor, as a yeah. member of the family. Yes. You know, of, of the community. And so I, I think that uh, when you show up at uh, Christmas services in a country like this country, and you see Muslims that have come yeah. to give Christmas greetings, yeah. where you know extremists who have hijacked Islam for other reasons, yeah. you know. I mean, how many fatwas have been issued that say, you know, it's it's uh, it's immoral to wish Christians Merry Christmas? Well, I, I you know, people here I, they wouldn't think to not wish Christians you know, Mer Merry Christmas. It would be immoral not to wish yes. them, you know, a, 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 a Merry Christmas. And so it's those little gestures, you know, that I think are uh, deeply, deeply meaningful. Because I don't actually believe religion is the problem in the world. Yeah. I think it's the solution. Yes. You know, and as a devout Christian who believes and follows Jesus, when a Muslim leader says uh, inshallah or hamdallah mm. or or in the name of god the compassionate and the yes. merciful you know that's that speaks to me yes. now, that doesn't mean i'm less of a christian or i believe any differently but it but i can relate to that and what i also find in this part of the world where you know people are often all mixed up in politics and religion and politics gets mixed up in a very very unhelpful way um, if i'm just a religious person talking to another religious person or a religious leader talking to a religious leader, or a religious person who's in a position of power or a political position, and I just talk about religion, I got other things to talk about. Yes. I don't have to talk about whatever the news of the day is. You know, it's our mutual adoration for God that is the meeting point. And the second part of it is, 
for our children. Yes. You know, it's a young world yes. that we're living in. And um, the tragedies of recent years, mm -hmm. um, we uh, cannot let happen again. And the Bahraini way, going back not a decade or two decades, but centuries yes. for, demon, for generations, yes. demonstrates that um, there, there is a better way. It's a more righteous way. Yes. And our future generations is um, something that you kept in mind when uh, you uh, became or y you wrote uh, your best-selling uh, book, Defying ISIS. This work includes an overview of the extremist ideologies, the misinterpretations of the Islamic religions, and um, how these uh, extremists use these misinterpretations to actually fulfill their goal of pulling in um, the younger generations in a very false uh, sense of, of truth that is, that is totally wrong. So t tell us a bit more about your book. You know, the extremists want uh, to divide Muslims amongst themselves, they mm -hmm. want to divide Muslims and Christians, they yeah. want to just, they want to just divide and they're using religion to do it. You know, and they, they call people like us, you know, crusaders, right, from the West, but yes. they don't tell the part of Islamic history that it was sometimes actually Christians who were standing against the Christian crusaders for their Muslim neighbors yes. in certain countries in this region. There are whole other stories to be told. And, you know, my reason for writing Defying ISIS was, uh, I watched what was happening, you know, in the Middle East. I went, I saw it for myself. And then every single person I talked to in Northern Iraq, they would tell me they felt forgotten. Yeah. That, that they, were, they were suffering in the shadows. And, and, and they wanted people to know their story. I mean, I remember meeting with this nun um, who had uh, had her monastery bombed in Mosul years before ISIS and then was r and, and moved to a city called Karakosh. Mm -hmm. And then she had gotten run out of Karakosh by ISIS, barely survived. And I met her late at night, because even weeks after these terrorists had committed these horrible acts in yes. her town, she was still suffering from it, but she was still serving people. And she was serving Christians and Muslims and Yazidis, regardless of their religion, because she, she loved her people. Yeah. She loved her neighbors. And she told me late at night, because the only time she had, she said, she said, uh, uh, I am uh, a Catholic. I am a nun. She said, I love America. It's a beautiful country, wonderful people. She said, I have a PhD from an American university. And then she said, so why are you silent in the face of our genocide? She said, you care for your pets so well. Yeah. Like, when are you going to care for us? And I made that nun a promise in that house that evening in Iraq that I would, that I would tell her story. And I would tell the stories of people like them. And the stories I began to tell weren't just the stories of suffering Christians, but the lost stories uh, of coexistence. Yes. You know, when, when the, uh, um, the, the letters from the prophet to the Christian world, you know, for instance, covenants, where you know, it says that you know, Muslims ought to, you know, if a Christian asks for help or if their church is damaged or destroyed, they ought to help re rebuild yes. the churches you know, that, that, that are destroyed. They're, they're there are hundreds and hundreds of these things, you know, in Islamic texts and Islamic history. And so I, I'm trying my best to bring the religions of, of the world together in a conversation against uh, e extremism. And that doesn't, again, it doesn't mean that you, you know, I'm going to change my Christian beliefs. It doesn't mean that you're going to change your Islamic beliefs. In fact, I believe in the marketplace of religious ideas. Yes, you know, true. In fact, this is what uh, I think was so profound about um, His Majesty King Hamad here in Bahrain, when he um, became the messenger of the Bahrain Declaration. This document was a profound religious freedom document. Yes. And the points that were included in the document were unlike any other um, points included in any other document to come from this entire region, where he said things like, people ought to be able to choose what they believe, that every human being is made in the image of God, that religion ought not to be used uh, to provoke uh, violence, that, that, that religious leaders, in fact, have a special responsibility uh, to, to serve uh, society. And so from defying ISIS, when frankly, uh, I was pretty depressed about the world that we were coming into, to the Bahrain Declaration, where I have become incredibly optimistic about the world we're living in, 
Uh, and as I watch other countries in the region follow the same path with, frankly, Bahrain at the lead of it, yes. uh, because it's in the, as I said, it's in the DNA here, yeah. uh, and it has been for generations. I, I, actu I actually thinking, I think, I, I'm actually beginning to think that we're more than winning the fight. You know, we're, we're preserving um, the best of faith yes. when the worst of religion has threatened the future of our children, and we're saying it's not going to happen not going to happen on our watch. Yes. You can try to divide us, but you're going to it's not going to stop me from calling you my neighbor, my friend. And Absolutely. if you're in need, it's my problem. And if I'm in need, it's your problem because we're citizens Absolutely. of this country, of my country, of the world that we're living in, and we have to decide what kind of world we're going to deliver to our children. Absolutely. Um, one of the really important um, things that I've learned over my life is when you say, when you see somebody in suffering and you say, oh, I imagine that was difficult. No, you cannot imagine how difficult it has been for these people. And saying something more um, reliable, like I can't imagine what you went through, really gives that message of, yes, this is difficult, and I hope I never go through this. And that really gives you that humanitarian edge um, that you are talking about. Um, well, and, and just to add on to that, I mean, and I don't mean to uh, talk obsessively about no, the king, but what strikes me about King Hamad here in Bahrain is when you meet with him, you know, mm -hmm. as I have, you know, he talks empathetically. Yes. You know, he, he, he talks emotionally about the people in this kingdom, about, you know, he looks with adoration, you know, at the, at the devotion to religion, you know, of people across uh, the, faith, the faith spectrum. And, True. you know, that is, a, uh, that is an admirable characteristic, and it's something we all should strive for, where we all look at our neighbor's children as if they were our own. Okay. You know, it's harder to do, you know, in the world we're living in, the digital age and all these people trying to do yes. all of these things. But... Um, but it's but it's possible. It's necessary. Yes. Well, there that that at uh, that part um, uh, is where media actually came uh, in, and media had a very big role in uh, promoting uh, Bahrain's opening and foundation of the King Hamad Global Center uh, for Interfaith Dialogue and Peaceful Coexistence. Um, how do you see the role of um, the media in promoting coexistence, promoting? Um, the center, as well as promoting um, the fact that the center is located in the middle, in the heart uh, of uh, the Middle East, on the Silk Road, and uh, a, a cradle of civilizations, as we talked about before. Well, the, the, the King Hamad Center is in the right place with the right message at the right time. Yeah. You know, and the fact that um, it, it, it has the patronage of you know, an, an Arab king, you know, this is one of the things that was unique about the Bahrain Declaration. There have been other tremendous, tremendous efforts at, at bringing together the Islamic world, you know, the Marrakesh Declaration, some yes. of these other, other documents. But they you know, were primarily messages from scholars to scholars, from yes. leaders to leaders. But the Bahrain Declaration was a message from a, uh, a king, an Arab king in the Gulf to the masses, to yes. millions of people with a vision for a different world. And, uh, and with, with the country itself being an example of how this can work. The King Hamad Center, it builds on that. It's mm -hmm. one step more because it, it becomes this convening place where people can come together and they can, they can uh, work together on problems that, that threaten to break coexistence. They can work together on charitable efforts where, where people of different faiths can serve you know, those, those in need. And it, it shows a, uh, a, a new reality in, in a time where people are, are often, um, frankly, uh, what concerns me as a deeply religious person is that many young people have given up on faith mm -hmm. because they've seen too much of the, um, the worst of faith, right? But what the King Hamad Center does, along with the, you know, the, the chair at La Sapienza and the declaration and the programs um, that have happened promoting it all around the world is it's brought together many generations, many credible, reputable religious leaders, and it's created, frankly, a movement uh, that is being um, uh, that is that is being fueled. You know, it, it's now you know th those who want to promote extremist ideology, you know, they're they're on the run. You know, yes. it's this this is a moment where uh, people are stepping up. You know, yes. and by the way, for Christians, yeah. you know, it's it's important for us to uh, have humility. You know, about about these things. And uh, I, I often say in the United States, and I wrote in Defying ISIS, um, let's just remember that terrorists killed more Muslims yes. exponentially than Christians or anyone else. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you sit across from a Muslim 
whose child died at the hands of a terrorist mm -hmm. as a Christian. You know, we have to tell these stories. You know, that's the other thing I love about the King Hamad Center. It can tell these stories, historic stories, like you know the fact that there's been um, you know there's a Jewish cemetery here. You know that's that's you know, that has, has continued on. The churches in, in this uh, in this kingdom were yes. established, you know, over a hundred years ago. The, the historic documents are there. They're incredible stories about the region. You know, yes. they're they're they're. You know other countries in the region whose whose leaders, whose kings, in fact, be became fatally ill, and they called for a Christian doctor who saved their lives. There, yes. you know, I, I uh, recently was uh, in Egypt, where um, you know the Egyptian president uh, opened uh, a cathedral mm -hmm. uh, for the for the Coptic Orthodox uh, Church, and uh, the the evening before the cathedral was opened, a uh, a police officer, um, a Muslim police officer, died dismantling a bomb outside of another church yeah. in Egypt. And that Muslim was celebrated as a hero by the Christian and the Islamic community. So while all the, you know, all the people in the region that want to divide and, and stoke sectarianism and tell all the, uh, the horrific moments for history, where all of our religions made mistakes and all of our leaders made mistakes, the H King Kamad Center has the job of compiling the inspirational stories yes. where Christians and Muslims and others stood together in defiance of those who want to divide us. The best of faith when other people want to talk about the worst of religion. And by the way, there are more great stories than yes. there are bad ones. We just got to tell them. Yes. And one of um, uh, the things that you mentioned in uh, describing the King Hamad Global Center previously was that they have the ability to save lives with these inspirations, with these stories, with these meetings and conferences. Um, the uh, King Hamad Global Center, uh, before it was um, established, there was a launch in Los Angeles that you yourself were a part of, and you gave a fabulous speech there, um, on uh, 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 where the declaration, the Bahrain Declaration, uh, the Kingdom of Bahrain Declaration was basically um, uh, presented to the world. What, how do you value the declaration, especially being an actual active part in making it happen? You know, I, I have to tell you, when we were... Um, Originally discussing the declaration, uh, you know, it was clear that the uh, the king wanted to do this and take this profound action. And then we all began talking about what would, you know, it, what it would address. And I have to say, you know, I, I uh, had become a bit skeptical, you know, traveling around around the world. There were a few parts of the declaration that I was like, ah, you know, in the end, this isn't going to be in there. And in the end, it was all there. And in Los Angeles, and why Los Angeles? because it's the heart of culture in yeah. the entire world. And in that evening, every religion, there were business executives and top Hollywood producers and people from, from all over the country yeah. in the United States and around the world came to attend, you know, people from all over the world. And it was one profound statement. And by the way, in partnership with a Jewish organization. Yes. So here are the Abrahamic faiths, and the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the King Kamad Center, and, and a, a rabbi, a pastor, and the representative of a Muslim king, all standing together on the stage saying, this is the future. Yes. You know, it's not what all those other people say it is, and we're going to defy them. You know, when I wrote the book, Defying ISIS, yes. you know, some people told me, they said, you know, are you sure that's the right thing to do? It seems like you might, it's like, yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm defying, I'm defying the hatred and the bigotry. And, I, and right. that's what we did, yes. you know, we, uh, Every act of solidarity is an act of defiance to those who divide us. And that I felt as I gave that speech and as I sat in that room and as we all went up and we signed that document, and by the way, in front of the picture of the king, Yes. I felt like, like we were a part of history. Yes. And in that moment, I was doing it for my children's world. Yes, and uh, definitely when the signing was there, everybody um, at uh, that uh, that launching was asked to come and sign or whoever wanted to or didn't want to, but it was made available to the public to sign the declaration. We had tremendous numbers at the end. Um, in order to root uh, the actual um, uh, purpose of the King Hamad Global Center and the declaration of the Kingdom of Bahrain, um, the King Hamad Chair in Interfaith Dialogue and Peaceful Coexistence was formed at uh, the University of Sapienza in Rome. Um, this is a new academic discipline and the first of its kind in the whole entire 
world where people actually say, okay, you're going to study coexistence and tolerance. Give us your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's an incredibly important part of this of this equation. You know, that uh, all of this is working together. Yes. But it's all different. You yes. know, the declaration is a it's a uh, as we would say a shot heard round the world. It's yes. a it's a visionary document. It l sets the pillars in the sand. The King Hamad Center, a convening place, a uh, aggregating history and present time and telling those stories. And the chair in Rome is training another generation of scholars and theologians yes. and humanitarians and political leaders that are going to have the knowledge and the skills in whatever profession, wherever they end up, whatever country they end up or re region that they end up in, they will be prepared. Because the fact is, in the last 10, 20 years, in the last century, or the last half a century, we've learned a lot. Yes. We've learned how people divide us. We've learned what sticks. We see models that work. And the, the La Sapienza program uh, is convening the next generation of leaders in an incredibly young world that we're living in. You know, I'm a millennial, you know, yeah. myself. You know, I, and when I look around, everybody around me, you know, in the Middle East is about my age. You know, <laughs> it's, a, you know it's, a, it's a young, it's a young region. Yes. And we have to train a new generation and they have to be qualified, incredible. So when people say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, you can point at the degree on the wall. You can say, I have this experience. Yeah. And the other thing, by the way, you know, people would say, oh, that's all about religion or all of these things. But, you know, coexistence and tolerance, it's good for business. It's good for tourism. It's good for the future. I mean, yes. the, these are things. Like, people don't want to do business in, in places and visit places where they feel threatened because of who they are. And so I think there's been too little religion and too little of this in all these different sectors. And that's why having a anchor and a... Uh, university like La Sapienza is so um, critically, critically important. Perfect. Thank you so much, Reverend. Um, thank you for being with us today. This has really meant a lot um, uh, to uh, the whole region, um, having uh, someone uh, in, your, uh, in your position to come support uh, an organization like the King Hamad uh, Global Center. Um, any last words from you before we end the show? Only that uh, I'm proud to be a friend of Bahrain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Moore, for being with us today. And we also uh, like to thank you for watching and see you next week in another episode of Inside Edition.